I want to introduce Steve Early. Uh, I'm currently a labor journalist, but in his past he's been an organizer, a strike strategist, labor educator, and lawyer. He recently retired from his job as national staff member of the Communication Workers of America. Redeploy. I don't Redeploy. use the other, other yeah, R word. Right. Uh, communication workers, you know, they, they comprise a lot of different kinds of working people, from um, telephone linesmen to uh, telephone operators to uh, journalists in the newspaper guild that are affiliated with communication workers to a lot of uh, different people who work in the media, and TV stations, you know, all, all over the place. So truly, students. they are the communication workers of America. Um, so Steve's articles, review, and op-ed pieces have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, Boston Globe, as well as The Nation, uh, New Politics, Counterpunch, The Progressive, American Prospect, Working in the USA, New Labor Forum. Um, he, before he, you know, started his working career, he graduated from Middlebury College. What was your major? Political science. Political totally science. useless. Okay. <laughs> And then he got his law degree from Catholic University in D.C. So he's a little got, more useful. Yes. So um, he has written a book, and he's going to be talking about that as well. It's explaining how he worked his way into a writing career um, with, uh, through uh, the organized labor movement. Uh, his recent book is Embedded with Organized Labor, Journalistic Reflections on the Class War at Home. And uh, a future book will be about, or has just, uh, okay, this one, Civil Wars in U.S. Labor, Birth of a New Workers' Movement, or Death Rose of the Old. So thank you for coming. Well, thank you for and, having me. Um, I'll just turn it over to you. Great. Well, I want to thank uh, both Karen and Rick for the invitation, and uh, so many folks uh, showing up tonight. Um, how many people are here uh, because you're in the writing program? Show of hands. Maybe they're potential writing program students. <laughs> okay. And how many people are here uh, who've been involved with the Peace and Justice Center? Mm -hmm. okay. um, <clears throat> just to get a sense of uh, individual interest in the subject of writing, do we have anybody who works for either the Villanova or the Villanova Times here? Does any writing for student mm, paper? One. Which, the alternative paper? Or uh, the paper? Uh, uh huh. Oh, great. How long have you worked on the paper? Uh, for about three years. I do most of everything now. Terrific. Uh, anybody else with uh, any kind of writing experience? Uh, high school newspaper? Or, uh, what? Sports editor. Sports editor? Mm -hmm. Okay. I work in the writing center. Okay. I work in the writing center on campus uh -huh. where students are printing their essays. And Ooh. And then you help with copy editing, or you give them some suggestions? Um, yeah, mainly we focus on the structure of the content, but there is some. It's not really journalism. You have to be a very good writer to get to, to work in the writing scene. Well, that doesn't make great, say, I don't know. <laughs> you have to okay. be nominated and go through a big rigmarole to take a class. Anybody else doing any kind of writing related work? At the moment? No. no, not at the moment. It's, I did the team page in the Connecticut Post uh, oh. when I was in high school. Uh, you worked as an intern or? Uh, I was, um, it was just a student organization that I was a member for three years and the editor of in the last year. So that was paid. That was like a job. Fantastic. And anybody interested in going into any kind of uh, communications work? Uh, daily newspaper, broadcast, oh, yeah. What, yeah. what kind of print do you have? Journalism, okay, a little bit last century, but uh, <laughs> talk there. about what job uh, opportunities there still are. Um, I'm just looking for a job, so I mean, I, I'm willing to write about you that. and 15 <laughs> million other Americans at the moment. <laughs> uh, anybody else uh, seriously thinking about journalism or uh, any kind of work in public relations? Uh, uh, okay, now we're going to do the union poll. How many people here <laughs> have ever been in a union? Anybody ever had a job so far in their life? Were they? Oh, Which one? Uh, I name, but as far as um, stop and stop supermarkets. Uh huh. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't like in high school, so. So it's probably the food and commercial workers. Yeah. 
my first union, and I barely realized I was in it. The store manager <laughs> took my initiation fee. The dues came out. The pay was pretty good, but I wouldn't say the union did a great job of uh, making the summer help feel uh, a part of the organization. Did you work seasonally or part-time after school? Part-time. Yeah. yeah. Brother Rick? I was a teamster, you know, uh -huh. before graduate school. I was a good humor truck driver. Wow. That was that the same thing. Wow. All of a sudden, the dudes were coming out, and the shop steward visited me and told me, it was such a stereotype, that this is what you got to do. <laughs> and I was just part-time filling in for people, but and, and they did nothing to make me feel welcome. But I was a teamster for a summer. I know where Jimmy Hoff is buried. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of the more popular teamster jobs, yeah. being a... Uh, a good humor driver, and of course, uh, the Graduate Student Employees Union, State University of New York. Yeah, that's a well known one, right up there with the steel workers and the auto workers. <laughs> um, that's where Rick and I originally connected uh, in my uh, work back in the 1990s for the communication workers, uh, one of the uh, great fledgling unions that we got involved with was the Graduate Student Employees Union, the TAs and Research Foundation. Uh, staff at the uh, State University of New York, still functioning as a union, uh, 5,000 members statewide, and we had a long fight so that the uh, grad student employees would be treated as workers, not as students, and they could actually negotiate uh, with the state university system like uh, the other campus workers and the uh, faculty members who were also uh, unionized. Anybody come from a union family? Uh, I mean, oh, great. Dad or mom, an yeah. electrician, telephone worker? Um, communications electrician, I think is his proper title, but oh. he's a uh, CPR. In New Jersey? Uh, Illinois, actually. Oh. Uh, all family. Right. Anybody else from a generation ago, perhaps? A grandfather, a grandmother. All right. Um, I. Uh, I just want to say uh, a couple of words uh, about my own um, uh, journalistic work. I've uh, never been a full-time uh, daily newspaper writer, but as Karen indicated, I have done a lot of freelancing for a pretty wide range of publications over the years and tried to combine that with full-time work in the labor movement as a, a full-time union representative uh, helping <coughs> members of the communication workers with contract negotiations and organizing and strikes and day-to-day helping them with their day-to-day -day job problems. And I, like some of you, first got involved in uh, journalism as um, a high school student. My high school in Maranek, New York, had a position uh, for somebody who would be our high school correspondent for the local newspaper. So I had a column called the from the hilltop, where I got to report on all the exciting things that were going on in my high school, circa uh, 1964 to 67. Uh, and I would review school plays and write about uh, sports, and that was my start in journalism. Uh, in college, I, I was involved in the staff of the student newspaper, became the editor eventually and combined that in the late 60s with a lot of involvement in the movement against the war in Vietnam. So I, early on, we kind of became kind of an activist, and uh, what you might call advocacy journalist, uh, as many people did who worked for student papers during that period. Uh, we covered protest movements, feminism, and a lot of uh, controversial issues and topics, and tended to have a kind of investigative reporting attitude towards the college administration and would run exposés about uh, you know, various things that we felt the dean or the college president hadn't done well. We had a whole campaign against military recruitment on campus, which was a very hot issue back then, uh, locally and nationally. Um, after I uh, got out of school uh, in college, I, I went to law school at Catholic University in DC and uh, went to law school at night so I could get a job during the day. And my first job in the labor movement was with a union publication, United Mine Workers Journal, which back in the 1970s was a very unusual uh, union publication. Uh, the coal miners union at that time was much bigger than it is today. It was one of the largest uh, organized groups of energy workers, had about a quarter of a million members. Today it's uh, down to about 10 to 20,000. And um, the union newspaper 
for a period of four or five years in the mid 70s, unlike most union publications, which tend to be kind of house organs, kind of like the, uh, the Villanova alumni magazine. Uh, the good news. The good news. Uh, actually sponsored investigative reporting. I mean, we went out, we talked to coal miners, uh, we reported on occupational health and safety issues and problems, a very big uh, problem then and now for coal miners. You know, people working underground coal mines have to deal daily with the hazards of uh, uh, operating heavy equipment in confined spaces. There's uh, a lot of electrical hazards. Uh, there's a little problem with methane gas, which can blow you up. Uh, coal dust, which can get in your lungs and leave you uh, chronically ill and disabled. And then, unlike most workers, you have to worry about the roof, because if it's not kept in place through constant roof folding and timbering, um, you have roof falls. And uh, people who've been following the news know in the last year or so, there's been a series of uh, accidents, uh, disasters uh, in coal mines, uh, one in West Virginia, uh, and a number of miners have died. And it's revived uh, public interest in this whole question of coal mine safety and a state and federal regulation in that area is strong enough. And actually the current uh, president of uh, the United Mine Workers, uh, or a fellow who became president of the United Mine Workers and is now the president of the AFL-CIO, the National Labor Federation, is an alumni of your distinguished institution, Rich Trumka from Western Pennsylvania, who went to law school here, came from a coal mining family, uh, worked summers, and uh, between high school and college in the mines where his father and grandfather had worked. And he went from law school here in 1974 to a job at the United Mine Workers headquarters in DC. Um, later went back uh, to work in the mines for another two or three years to become eligible to run for union office. Ended up being the national president of the union and is now the national president of the AFL-CIO. Anybody ever heard of Rich Duncan? A test of <laughs> the visibility of organized labor. You've heard of him. In this class, so I have. Uh, <laughs> anybody ever run across his name in a newspaper, uh, on TV, a talk show? On a... We'll have to get him here. Yes, we do. <laughs> We're not just talking. It's a lost. One students. of my goals. I'm Very sorry. interesting guy to come from a blue collar working class background to go to Penn State and the law school here. Go back underground to qualify uh, himself to uh, run for union office and you know he had worked in the general counsel's office uh, and then went back and became a working miner and then you know, worked his way up through the system of electoral politics within the union to be a uh, very important leader of the union and now the, the whole labor movement. So um, I spent most of my union career, uh, as Karen mentioned, with the communication workers, a very diverse union that represents everybody from journalists to telephone workers, uh, along with uh, the IBW in many parts of the country, flight attendants, uh, we have uh, broadcast technicians, manufacturing workers, public employees, folks in higher education. And I did that for nearly 30 years, and during that time, uh, tried to write as much as I could uh, on the side about issues related to workers' rights, collective bargaining, industrial relations, trends in the telephone industry, and other industries that impact uh, workers and consumers. Uh, labor history is another interest of mine. And uh, you know, one of the openings uh, that I had to contribute to mainstream dailies, particularly my two local rags in Boston, the Herald and the Globe, was the fact that during the uh, 80s, the 90s, and uh, in more recent years, the newspaper coverage of labor has really shrunk. Uh, it used to be when the labor movement uh, in this country 50 or 60 years ago represented 30, 35% of the workforce. Um, every paper, major paper, had a very experienced reporter assigned to what's called the labor beat, someone that followed major strikes and contract negotiations, often had a column, uh, just as many papers have uh, business section columns today that deal with stocks and bonds and what's happening with hedge funds and uh, the, the latest developments in the local real estate market. Believe it or not, newspapers used to have a column devoted to workers and the workplace and what was going on in relations between 
uh, workers and their employers. Uh, all that's changed quite a bit over recent decades. Uh, most of the experienced labor reporters have been laid off or forced into retirement. A couple of major papers still have uh, fairly well-known specialists the New York Times, the fellow named Steve Greenhouse, uh, who writes uh, pretty consistently about labor. But labor issues tend to have been stashed in most newspapers in the business news section of the paper, and um, uh, really doesn't get uh, as much attention as it used to, and we can come back to some of the causes and consequences of that. So uh, I tried to use the fact that uh, oftentimes labor issues were uh, underreported uh, by the full-time staff of the paper to uh, pitch article ideas to uh, what are called op-ed page editors. Everybody know what the opposite editorial page is in a newspaper? What is it, do you know? The op-ed page? Opposite the editorials, op-ed. This is today's Philadelphia Inquirer. And over here we have the editorials. We have letters to the editor, which is what the readers are complaining about in the last couple of weeks' worth of uh, inquiry coverage. And over here, we have the commentary page that most papers have. This guy is a syndicated columnist, rather conservative, whose views appear in a lot of papers. And over here, you have uh, an example of uh, people uh, who are not on the staff of the paper, not syndicated columnists, contributing opinion pieces, taking kind of pro and con positions on a public policy issue related to for-profit colleges. So the op-ed page is an opportunity for non-staff members, um, both ordinary people and people who have uh, some expertise or claim to have some expertise in a particular area to write about a topic of interest. And there's a, an editor, uh, uh, different from the letters to the editor, editor, and different from the editors who write the paper's own editorials, uh, who field submissions from uh, a wide range of people. And for me, this became a, an outlet for writing about labor issues. And you usually need a peg, like you know, it's Labor Day, the one day of the year when <laughs> the mainstream media pays a little more attention to to workplace issues. Um, sometimes, um, you know, uh, I would tie a piece to an anniversary of a strike or some other event in labor history that might have some local residents. Um, my daughter graduated from college a couple of years ago as a Latin American studies major. Um, helped her uh, pitch a piece to the Boston Globe that was tied into Mother's Day and actually could have been published on Valentine's Day, and it was about where flowers come from on these days when everybody is giving uh, their mothers and lovers and other people flowers. Uh, she had been to Columbia, uh, where they have a big floriculture industry, and a lot of mothers uh, are exploited uh, handling these uh, flowers that we import. So it was kind of an interesting angle. Of the, I like the idea that a young person had gone down there, met with Colombian flower workers, and was a little bit about the story of the industry, the conditions that people work under, where this product comes from, you know, which I had never thought much about. I'm sure most people thought much about. So that's uh, one place where, um, you know, even those of us who have uh, kind of an activist orientation, uh, uh, political views that might be a little bit out of the mainstream, can still get a little ink today. Uh, even though the trends in the press generally are towards consolidation, a more kind of corporate view of things, uh, more coverage of business-related news, certainly than, than labor news. And um, uh, I also, for the Boston Globe, would write for their Sunday feature and opinion section um, until that was uh, reformatted. Um, you know, that, that the thing I want to mention today that seems to be of uh, most interest in terms of the challenges and opportunity of people breaking in uh, to writing for uh, a wider audience is uh, the way that the new media really has uh, kind of democratized things. And I'm sure most people here don't spend a lot of time poring over hard copies of papers. Um, my daughters, who are your age, uh, get their news from blogs and from websites and from listservs. 
Um, if they read newspapers, they tend to read them online. And, uh, you know, people today are actually finding they can break into uh, journalism, in the sense of actually publishing, uh, by posting material online, starting their own blogs, um, writing for uh, even well-known uh, outlets like the Washington <coughs> Post or Politico or Slate or any number of uh, knockoffs of, of those kind of high-profile uh, online media outlets. Um, meanwhile, it's gotten harder for people to get paid for what they write, I mean, which is a very big issue. I mean, uh, when I was doing freelance pieces, I, Newspapers used to pay $150, $200 for one of these editorial opinion uh, pieces, four or $500 for uh, an opinion piece on Sunday. Today, so many people are willing to write for free, uh, and there's so much free content out there online that it is almost impossible for people to survive as a freelance journalist. And if you don't have an academic position, you don't know, work in some way for an organization that provides a salary, if you don't you're not a trust fund baby, <laughs> um, or have some other source of income, do some other kind of writing work uh, for pay, it's very hard to survive just based on trying to write for magazines and, and newspapers as a freelance contributor. Um, and it was always difficult and challenging, but it was uh, possible for some people to actually make a living doing that um, 20 or 30 years ago. But again, the upside is that it's easier to break in. There's fewer gatekeepers. People can make a name for themselves through online um, reporting, commentary, you know, to write about travel, for example. Travel writing being a, an important genre. You know, newspapers have uh, travel sections, but you know, they only run two or three pieces uh, a week sometimes. There's a travel editor that you've got to pitch stories to. Well, now people uh, write for TripAdvisor. They start their own blog and, uh, you know, uh, post reports on what they're doing in their, you know, trek through Patagonia or their uh, mountain climbing experience or, and, you know, some of the writing is pretty good. Some of it's kind of amateurish and could probably use the, <laughs> the writing center <laughs> Uh, once over, but um, it's easier in some ways now for people to break in, to get discovered, and to make the transition from uh, online to hard copy publication. In some cases, even book publishing. You know, you continually hear stories of people who started very interesting um, with a distinctive voice, uh, uh, individual kind of blog, and some person trolling for new talent in the publishing world. Um, discovers them and calls them up and said, hey, have you ever thought about taking your uh, you know, blog posts and reworking them into some sort of a book, either a collection like this one here or uh, some other kind of book idea? So, um, you know, the, the new media is, is kind of chaotic. It's in some ways more egalitarian, more democratic. Uh, another downside is that there's you know, a lot of kind of misinformation passing for news. I mean, a lot of the writing is more opinion writing, commentary. There's not um, a lot of fact checking. And the publications that do still employ professional uh, writers and editors are having a harder and harder time uh, surviving because there is so much free content out there and they have to find a way uh, through advertising, which they've lost a lot of revenue in hard copy publications. Uh, to continue to support the overhead of having the staff of professional people uh, producing uh, news uh, and opinion and uh, other newspaper content, book review, an entertainment section of, a, of you know, a generally higher quality than you're going to find in most parts of uh, the internet uh, journalism world. Um, why don't I, uh, anybody, Interested in the subject of book publishing? I mean, we can get into that in a in, in the question and discussion. I'm kind of a latecomer to the field, but uh, fascinated by uh, how that has changed also. So um, we could talk a little bit about that. But um, why don't I stop here for a moment and just see if people have questions about um, writing, the state of journalism today, and how people can find a way uh, to make a living uh, writing or you know, 
pursue it as a, as a part-time uh, activity while having a day job. Yeah. Writers who um, write on blogs, how do they usually go about making um, making any kind of a living from that? Is it because of the advertisers who are? Yep. Yeah. I think it's very hard because uh, so many blogs, so little time. And how do you draw readers? I mean, uh, it seems to me that that um, you know people begin to make a splash when they find ways to cross post and get other people to you know link to their site. Um, uh, and some have been able to draw enough readership and demonstrate that they have it to start selling online ads. Um, again, you know, you need to um, you need to have a successful blog to do, or website to do that. But um, that is one way that people have started to generate income for themselves, as opposed to um, just doing it as, as a you know a contribution <laughs> to all the rest of us. Today, what they've done for us, because I'm not sure everybody's too familiar with all that. Long history. Yeah. Well, um, certainly, I was very struck by uh, the need for people in uh, very dangerous and difficult jobs, um, over-the-road trucking. Spent a couple of years working with a, a group of teamsters that were uh, trying to improve truck safety. Coal miners. Um, you know, construction workers, this, uh, energy workers, I know you've been looking at them, certainly following the terrible uh, offshore oil drilling disaster, which was both an environmental disaster, but initially um, a huge uh, workplace accident uh, where workers lost their lives and others were badly injured. Um, you know, uh, in the white collar world of uh, call centers and banks and finance and higher education, I mean, we tend to forget that there's still millions of people who are laboring under, in some cases, 19th century conditions. And uh, the work is hard, it's physically demanding, it's dangerous, it exposes them to toxic chemicals and other substances that can uh, affect their health if they spend many years doing that particular kind of job. And one thing that attracted uh, me uh, was, uh, you know, interviewing people, writing about conditions, um, uh, trying to agitate for stronger negotiated union contract health and safety protections and stronger legal protections. I mean, there's a lot of pressure from the business community in this country for less regulation and, uh, frankly, less regulation of workplace health and safety conditions translates uh, to one degree or another, depending on the industry you're talking about, to people losing their lives, losing their limbs, uh, and suffering, in some cases, long-term occupational uh, health problems. So um, most of my original writing in the 70s was about occupational health and safety and uh, you know, what, what needed to be done about that. But you know, there's lots of um, occupations that lend themselves to very interesting non-academic explorations of the labor process. My wife was a journalist for a number of years doing books on random uh, subjects. She was a pretty successful, you know, kind of mid-level nonfiction writer. She wrote a book about ballet. She wrote a book about loneliness as a mass social problem. She wrote a book about feminism. And she kind of started writing about nursing and healthcare. And it sold about 100,000 copies of a series of five or six books that have become very popular with nurses, one of the biggest healthcare professions, you know, two to three million RNs in this country. Um, they are all the doctor shows, notwithstanding the people who do most of the real caregiving work in hospitals. Uh, the doctors wouldn't uh, agree with that. Uh, and, um, you know, most of them, not all, have uh, four-year degrees. They are very into continuing education, have lots of conferences, and, and uh, get educational credits for continuing education work. So, and there are, of course, nursing schools. So my wife is a journalist who started to focus on a field, uh, focusing on an important occupation profession 
writing uh, from a pro rank and file nurse perspective about the day to day problems that nurses face in our healthcare system. And she's become very popular. Um, uh, people use her books, some of them, as uh, texts in nursing schools. Um, they invite her to speak at conferences. So she's able to supplement her earnings as an author and a freelance journalist by uh, charging for speeches, not uh, Bill Clinton prices, but you know, nobody pays me three or four thousand dollars to give a speech, and they do her, so <laughs> she must be doing something right. But you know, she found an audience that's literate, uh, education oriented, um, has important workplace problems like staffing levels, right? How many patients should a nurse safely be required to care for in any one? Point in time. I mean, the nursing organizations have been fighting for what are called nurse patient staffing ratios. That's a they have campaign. unions too, don't they? Yeah, about 20% of all nurses are unionized in this country. And again, we're not talking about a coal miner, a truck driver, a uh, construction worker, you know, the people, you know, the auto worker traditionally associate with having a union card. But for nurses, it really makes a difference to be able to as a patient advocate, speak up without fear of being retaliated against by an employer. And collectively, nurses have been able to fight for um, uh, both through their contract bargaining and through changes in state and federal laws, um, a lot of uh, new regulations that have forced hospitals to operate more safely, makes their job better, and uh, the patients have a better chance of surviving their hospital stay. So, um, you know, I think there's other occupations where people could develop a similar readership, um, so we teaching and social work to professions, uh, particularly teaching, uh, where a lot of public policy controversies are swirling around at the moment. And uh, I think part of the trick of developing a career is really, uh, you know, finding your own personal beat, even if it's not recognized as such anymore uh, by the newspaper industry but developing some expertise, developing some contacts and institutional relationships, and developing a track record so you become known as someone who is worth reading about a particular uh, field. For the people who are interested in getting a newspaper job, what, what kind would you like? If somebody, if I was the representative of Rupert Murdoch and was hiring here, so they're just shooting my mouth off. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I could get you a job at the Wall Street Journal. What, what, what would you like to write about? Well, ideally, I'd like to travel. Uh huh. Correspondent job. Uh huh. So, foreign correspondent covering anything, I guess. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, how many people have. Um, uh, Read, uh, I mean, there's been some wonderful war reporting. Obviously, we have two terrible wars that have cost us about a trillion dollars in direct costs in the last seven or eight years. But, um, you know, it's been a minor book publishing industry writing about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, you know, one form of being a foreign correspondent when you have a country that gets into as many foreign wars as we seem to is that uh, there's a lot of. Um, it's a dangerous warfare to write for, very dangerous. dangerous. Um, anybody uh, read, know Sebastian Junger, who wrote The Perfect Storm? He's got a new book out called War, which was made into a great documentary film called Restrepo. Um, you might want to check him out. I mean, he's someone who um, has written a series of very interesting nonfiction books about. Um, well, in the, case of the perfect storm, um, another hazardous uh, occupation, uh, commercial fishing. He uh, followed uh, uh, the story of some lost fishermen who got caught in a terrible hurricane and lost their boat, lost their lives, and a great portrait of uh, that working class community in the North Shore of, of uh, Boston. Um, and his most recent tour of duty was in Afghanistan uh, two or three years ago. Uh, an embedded journalist, as they say, um, writing about one particular platoon and its experience in an isolated outpost. And he made it a multimedia project. He worked with a documentary filmmaker. And so 
is both a book called War and a wonderful documentary film called Restrepo uh, about the experience of you know these American soldiers stuck in a very difficult situation. A filmmaker and a journalist to protect as well as their own ass. So uh, you know one model for enterprising uh, journalistic work abroad. Anybody else, if they could uh, write their own ticket in journalism today, what would you write about? I remember we didn't have a whole lot of them that were really interested in being journalists, so. Yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah. Uh, possibly sports journalism. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm particularly fascinated by baseball, um, particularly fascinated by the whole situation with regards to steroids and the interaction between the, the players union and the owners and things like that. Yeah. Um, you know, sports reporting used to be thought of as a fairly, well, I mean, it was a, it was steady work, right? And but a lot of reporters saw their job as either constantly criticizing the home team or being a cheerleader for the home team. Now you've got a whole field of investigative reporting, people doing amazing stuff about head injuries and, uh, you know, the scandal of the football owners and how they're dealing with uh, uh, retired players with these uh, job-related uh, injuries and uh, you know the labor relations uh, side of that beat is often very contentious um, so sports reporting has become um, uh, you know both broadcast and print um, a very very interesting field and people often do spin-off book projects um, big readership for books about professional sports and famous athletes, past and present, so very good field to, to get into. Sports seems to be one of the few places within print journalism that might actually be expanding right now. Yeah. In daily newspapers, it seems to be yeah. more and more column inches for sports and less and less for uh, news. Yeah. And I think, you know, the more people come at it, uh, as they have been lately, uh, I mean, people don't think of professional athletes as workers, right? Because we think, ah, they're making millions, and uh, they're, you know, well, you know, there are some people that do make a lot of money, and they're top athletes. But then you have a lot of journeymen uh, who don't last long in some of these leagues. Um, some of them end up with lifelong injuries and other problems. They don't qualify for pension. Um, some of them have dropped out of school to go into professional sports. They have difficulty, um, you know, getting back on any kind of productive career track. So, you know, some of the more interesting writing has been about the, the little folks in the field, uh, not just the big stars. Um, the book that my wife did a number of years ago about ballet. Um, you know, she was not a, a letter main, I think that's the word. She was not somebody writing about it from the standpoint of, you know, everything's beautiful with the ballet, I love, you know, the Nutcracker Suite. She was writing about it from the standpoint of exploited women workers. You know, she was one of the first people to blow the whistle on anorexia as a serious occupational health issue in ballet. Uh, and she covered a strike by the uh, American ballet theater dancers where some of the demands had to do with the conditions of the uh, stages that they were forced to dance on, the uh, resulting injuries that they suffered to their feet and legs and and uh, of course the, you know, the, the constant pressure to dance essentially underweight because of this image of female dancer beauty that George Balanchine and others kind of imposed on um, Know, that, that folks in that field. So trying to find, you know, an angle, you know, it's not intentionally necessarily debunking the mainstream or the conventional wisdom, but it is a different take. It's very important. Um, you know, whether you're pitching an article or an op-ed piece or you know, have a book idea or um, any kind of writing that, uh, you know, you're trying to distinguish in some way your work from the pack. Yeah. I have a question that's more related to the media coverage of the um, yeah. unions. Mm -hmm. um, you said that you know there's not a lot of coverage of of unions of labor issues in media, and I I perceive that a lot of the coverage out of it does exist in certain um, 
news outlets is rather negative. Yeah. I'm thinking about, you know, when Citizens United came out, there all there's all this fear like now the union's power is gonna run amok and there's this there's this idea that they are really power um, power centers. And I just saw, you know, waiting for Superman and when they had the mm. the union speaking there, they had Darth Vader music playing in the background <laughs> and just she seemed really evil. How many the, people have <laughs> seen Superman? This is <laughs> so just and so no matter which union it is, the teachers' yeah. union or the whatever yeah. union, it, it just it, it seems that it's increasingly portrayed as a power center that, um, and I know that the the um, membership has declined in the years, and you and your involvement probably spanned this decade. So, what is have you seen this change in the unions and change in the media coverage? And those terms? Yeah, well, I think when you don't have people um, covering um, labor relations kind of continuously, there's a tendency to focus on a strike, a corruption scandal, um, you know, some real or imagined example of feather bedding, you know, somebody's caught sleeping on the job at the, the transit system, um, you know, as opposed to the fact that day in and day out, uh, unions, uh, when they're functioning the way they should, are providing people with a voice at work and some minimal amount of due process and disciplinary proceedings and a somewhat, I think, fairer method of uh, of uh, advancing um, yourself in, in, in your career. Um, you know, the top executives in this country have no problem with negotiating individual employment contracts you know, with the compensation committees of the board of directors of all the major corporations. You know, one of my adversaries for years, uh, the phone company, was a guy named uh, Ivan Seidenberg, who's the head of Verizon. He makes about $20 million a year, but he has a contract. It's in writing. It's binding, right? If they ever push old Ivan out ahead of his planned retirement date, he's got what's called a golden parachute, you know? He's got stock options and bonuses, and, and it's not all a handshake deal. He had his lawyer negotiate this with uh, the compensation committee from the board of directors that he had uh, picked. So in some ways he was bargaining with himself. But they somehow have a problem if a group of people at the bottom of the, you know, corporate pyramid do the same thing collectively, right? And want to get their terms and conditions, their health care coverage, their pension arrangements, and what they're going to be paid in writing in a binding legal document. And it, it's always struck me as a little bit of a double standard. It's okay to kind of, for the people at the top to have this stuff locked in and legally enforceable, uh, but the people at the bottom should be kind of like totally unprotected and just take their chances uh, with, with nothing work as employees at will can be fired at any time, um, you know, unless there's some race or age or uh, national origin type discrimination involved. So um, I, I think clearly the daily news coverage doesn't do a good job of explaining you know, the many positive things that unions do. I mean, you have to factor in that unions are employers themselves. Some of them have had their own kind of rocky labor relations. Um, and, uh, you know, so the owners uh, tend to have, in some cases, a not very favorable view of collective bargaining as an institution. Um, you know, some of the people who've been recruited to the journalism profession in recent years, uh, demographically, uh, in terms of their own class background, don't tend to come from union families as much as the old, more blue-collar breed of, of big city tabloid journalists. And, um, you know, and sometimes unions themselves misbehave in ways that generate bad publicity. I'd say the best publicity, you know, that we tend to get is when unions are trying to, um, you know, secure some minimal amount of justice for the most oppressed, you know, when janitors are trying to organize or security guards or cafeteria workers on a campus where they have student allies. You know, that kind of campaign often bucks at the heartstrings and people feel, you know, you can survive on $8 an hour, these folks should get a fair shake. But, you know, if it's a flight attendant or a phone company technician or a customer service rep or somebody that's seen as perhaps being overpaid because, Lord forbid, they make 45 or 50 or 55,000 a year, then you start to see a different kind of uh, you know, bias or slant creep into the, the reporting. So, how about the union busting firms and, and threats and intimidation that people do try to form? It's not like you just raise your hand and 
the boss says, oh, okay, you guys can have a union like it is in most industrial countries. Here it's fought tooth and nail, even though they have the right, it's in the law. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I you know write about in uh, <coughs> this uh, new book is uh, even some of the conflict that's developed um, you know, over the years within uh, Catholic church-run or influenced institutions, particularly in healthcare. Um, you know, there's a hundred years worth of papal encyclicals uh, celebrating the dignity of work and workers and uh, telling employers they should treat their employees fairly. Uh, a plea an that has, there, what's that? Asterisk. There's an asterisk. That doesn't include the Catholic Church. <laughs> well, that's, so some folks started, uh, particularly in healthcare, to point out that contradiction, and over a number of years, they put some pressure on the, the Conference of uh, Catholic Bishops, and you know they came out with a very good statement uh, in June of 2009, a report called Respecting the Just Rights of Workers, Guidance and Options for Catholic uh, Healthcare and Unions. And this was a, a long-awaited report, basically saying to uh, the uh, Catholic religious orders that still in some cases run hospital chains and individual hospitals that when their workers try to exercise uh, their supposedly legally protected right to form or join a union and bargain collectively that the management uh, and the, the owners, the orders in some cases, uh, should not spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on law firms uh, to fight these unionization efforts. They should lead the decision about whether to have a union or not up to the workers themselves. They shouldn't fire people and harass them and intimidate them and coerce them. And I mean, there's a pretty <coughs> appalling track record of some um, Catholic hospitals, nursing homes, and other institutions um, violating federal labor law uh, when workers try to organize. So, you know, but you're dealing with an institution that has good rhetoric on, on the subject, that has in some parts of the country uh, modeled its behavior much better. Uh, one of the biggest union organizing wins in Boston recently was in a Catholic hospital chain called the Caritas Christi chain, four hospitals who were recently organized as a result of an agreement that was worked out under the terms of this document that the, the bishops issued. And the management of the hospitals involved, which previously had fought unionization tooth and nail, uh, stayed neutral this time around. and the election results were entirely different than in the past. The workers in all four hospitals voted to join uh, the service employees in Boston. They negotiated a decent contract, and now they're in a much better position to deal with the sale of the hospital chain to a private equity firm called the Cerebrus Group, which is uh, going to convert these institutions into for-profit <laughs> hospitals. And that's exactly the kind of change in ownership, you know, kind of corporate restructuring, that if you don't have a collective voice, you're like powerless to have any influence over as a nurse, uh, as a lab tech, <coughs> as <coughs> cafeteria worker, or any other kind of hospital employee. So. Yeah? I was just curious about um, your thoughts on um, kind of the voice of the labor movement mm -hmm. as a communications person. Yeah. Um, we we're talking about how they, the press they usually get nowadays is negative yeah. press. And it's just kind of, I don't know, it's kind of frustrating. I mean, I see in my family when we, you get the newsletter every, you know, right in the recycle bin. They don't the National uh, yeah. IBW magazine? Yeah, they don't read I read it, but they don't read it. So, <laughs> yeah. you know. Well, I, that is, a, I, I know why they're throwing it away. The waste bin. <laughs> well, my point, my point yeah. is that, yeah. I mean, you've got huge organizations, yeah. you know, and they do spend millions of yeah. dollars on elections. Yeah. And, but don't you think maybe, I mean, this for instance is in print, you know, it's, yeah. it's kind of, I feel like they're losing a genera an entire generation of people who understand what the point is. Yeah. And so don't you think money would be better spent, you know, not on, I'm sorry, like losing, ele you know, yeah. losing elections, but rather than conveying to people what the point is. What the value As we would say in a, in a union meeting, I second your motion, brother. <laughs> I, I would agree. Much too much money has been spent lately, uh, often not well, on Democrats who have not been uh, too consistent in their support for workers' rights. And I think a small portion of that could definitely be uh, diverted to improving the quality of union publications. I mean, I mentioned earlier that the problem with a lot of union publications is they are kind of like house organs. They're like uh, family albums for the officials. Uh, only good news, no bad news, 
Um, you know, the standard picture is of somebody getting a back pay check because they want a discharge case. Very important to report that. But, um, you know, people day to day on the job are having problems. They don't see that in their own official publication. So they chuck it. Um, this newsletter, which has some samples around, has um, been around for 30 years, published monthly. It is online. Uh, it's called Labor Notes, and uh, its correspondents tend to be rank and file union activists from a variety of different unions. It's all the news that the official labor press doesn't see fit to print, and it's often controversial. Some people don't like it, but they actually have a letters to the editor column. So, unlike in most union newspapers, if you disagree with something, you can write in and they'll print your dissenting view, which uh, I don't think the IBW paper, <laughs> or even the CWA News does uh, well enough. And, um, you know, my experience with the Mine Workers Journal back in the 70s, we actually won a national magazine award from the Columbia uh, Journalism Review. First, and I think only time that a labor publication has ever been so recognized, and it was because we tried to break out of this house organ mold and um, interviewed workers, did investigative reporting, published self-critical articles about the union, right, and had a very freewheeling letters to the editor uh, page where there wasn't the usual sort of censorship. And guess what? Suddenly, the union paper had some credibility. There was, you know, there was a reason to pick it up and read it as opposed to uh, people perceiving it as kind of stale institutional propaganda that really doesn't have much connection to reality. So um, there's lots of room for improvement in, in the field of institutional labor journalism, whether it's online or, you know, a struggling hard copy publication. And a lot of unions, for cost reasons, scale back. So I don't know whether they have to throw the IBW paper away every month now or maybe just six times a year. <laughs> it's your dues money or your dad's uh, at work, but not at work as effectively as it should be. So who makes those decisions? Who and, and at well, what level are these decisions being The made unions, uh, contrary to how they're often depicted, are more democratic than most corporations. Uh, the, the leadership of unions are elected either directly by the membership in some unions or through a delegate system, kind of a representative democracy system of convention election, and they employ the you know, professional staff people in the headquarters. Um, again, it's another career option for people to think about being a press person or a communications person or a leaflet writer uh, for a labor organization. They do hire people with journalism skills and background, and social movement background. Um, the problem is, you know, the political constraints. It's like, um, you know, if you write in Boston, I don't know what the equivalent publication down here is, in Boston the diocese uh, has a paper called The Pilot, right? And it's the official organ of the Catholic Church in Boston. Um, it does not run <laughs> pro-abortion op-ed pieces on its, you know, opinion page, right? Because it sees itself as a uh, journalistic defender of uh, the party line of the church. Um, unfortunately, too many unions see the official union publication the same way. And by shutting out dissenting views, not having pro and con kind of exchanges, uh, not allowing rank and file people to express criticism, it you know, produces a pretty stale product that, that people aren't interested in. Um, and it, so it takes, you know, some staff people who are willing to push the envelope, it takes some leaders who are willing to uh, subject themselves to hopefully constructive self-criticism from within. And um, too many would just prefer to see pictures of themselves <laughs> in the publication. And it's kind of like PR publications for many corporation or any yeah. school board or your city council. I mean, if they are, the voice for themselves, yep. you know, it's it's unlikely they're going to be too critical. I mean, yeah. it, but, it's but I mean, there's a lot of people with editorial jobs. Any uh, Villanova has a magazine, I'm sure. You know, just about yeah, every college and university has an alumni bad news magazine. <laughs> Some of them actually do run very interesting articles by graduates, uh, okay. by. Uh, alumni by undergraduates, but um, you know I've seen my alumni magazine. Uh, somebody sometimes they'll run an article and there'll be a torrent of you know letters to the editor. What are you tearing down the reputation of our great school? Blah blah blah. I mean these editors are yeah. often on the hot seat. Um,
because they have multiple constituencies to serve, and they're trying to make their publication lively, lively and readable. Um, and you know, the, the, if every you know publication got dumbed down, you know, to this level, and you know, the, the metro has a clone in every city in the country. It's the, the, the subway paper of choice, but I mean, look at it. Half of it's about crime. The, the stories are six paragraphs long. I mean, that's a long story, you know, three or four. I mean, um, you know, when people try to elevate the content of, of any kind of publication, it involves taking some risks and um, possibly pissing some people off. But, you know, uh, that is what draws people to writing. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. I had a question kind of concerning the American labor movement mm. um, over a longer period of time because I'm working on a paper about the labor movement in the 1880s, oh, sort of that era, um, and the Knights of Labor at the time mm. were opposed to immigration yeah. um, because of the influx of workers and it threatened the workers' movement. So I'm kind of curious about the American labor movement today and if they have any kind of an agreement across the board about how they feel about immigration. Well, the the uh, union official union position, top level of the most organizing oriented unions, has gotten a lot better in recent years, uh, the, and it's part because with this huge influx of, of uh, low wage immigrant workers, um, unions like the service employees, the hotel workers, the garment workers, uh, the food and commercial workers, and some of the construction unions like the laborers and the carpenters. If they are not able to relate to foreign-born workers, well, they're not going to grow. I mean, and they're not going to um, represent the workers who, in some cases, have become a significant percentage of the workers in you know the occupations that uh, their members work in. So, uh, unions used to be more on the uh, anti-immigrant side, certainly historically. A lot of bad history there, including for much of the 20th century, but. Um, one of the brighter spots in the labor movement is that unions have become stronger advocates of immigrants and their rights. Um, you know, there are force in lobbying for legalization, um, for uh, less use of these workplace raids uh, where people don't have papers. But, you know, very often that kind of activity disrupts attempts to uh, to organize unions and um, uh, you know, but there's. The, the, you know, to be totally honest about it, there's always a gap between the official union policy making and uh, rhetoric, which in this case, you know, may, may be quite progressive in some unions, and you know, rank and file sentiment, because there's a lot of people who listen to right wing talk radio and Rush Limbaugh and you know, a variety of other people who kind of made quasi journalistic careers out of bashing immigrants, and uh, you know, there were union members, in my own union and many others who view uh, immigrant workers as a, as a job threat, uh, as a drain on you know, social programs. I mean, you know what the, the, the rap is on, on immigrant workers. And, uh, you know, some unions have been forced to do internal education and discussion and debate about this and try to make people more sensitive to the need for workplace and community solidarity. And that, uh, you know, employers historically have tried to pit the foreign-born and the native-born against each other unless people find a way to, to work together and overcome, uh, you know, certain amount of suspicion and, uh, you know, everybody's always going to end up being the loser. Um, so, yeah. So what are you doing, what are the unions doing, like, uh, for education, for people who aren't pursuing continuing education, for people who don't speak the language, for yep. people who aren't reading, like, um, more intelligent newspapers? Like, how yep. are they getting to this? Well, actually, some of the unions that uh, the service employees, particularly good uh, in this area with uh, uh, some of their janitor locals, they have been very strong about um, instituting uh, ESL programs and negotiating in their contracts with the building service companies, uh, even time off, um, you know, during the work day uh, to improve your English language skills. My daughter went to Wesleyan 
uh, and worked very closely with the unionized janitors there up in Connecticut and a unionized group of cafeteria workers. And one of the things that she helped with was uh, this hour of paid time for ESL training that the students themselves provided for uh, janitors who were native Spanish and Portuguese speakers. So, you know, you had the students one-on-one -on -one, uh, tutoring employees of contractor employed by the university. Um, you know, there was some overlap with the, 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 the labor cause on campus, but a lot of it was just helping out, you know, an individual who whose job opportunities were always going to be kind of limited unless they became more profession and proficient in English. And uh, so that, I think that is the kind of thing that the better unions are doing to enable people not just to be trapped in kind of bottom tier jobs, but um, acquire the job skills and the language skills necessary to kind of move up. Um, yeah. Uh, just so you again try to again expanding upon what you had mentioned about members of right wing radio and things like that. Uh, I know that a lot of members of the media are having a, a field day with regards to these these Tea Party movements and these yeah. Tea Party strikes and stuff like that. And I was wondering if whether or not there's there's a, an appropriate way of going about discussing this in in journalism and such because any opinions that I've seen so far regarding the Tea Party has been either relatively very liberal or, or very mm -hmm. conservative. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you have to pick a side. There's barely yeah. any room in between. What is what, what do you think is the safest way of going about, going about discussing Tea Party or other issues without being too liberal or too conservative? Well, I think uh, the, the journalists who have gotten beyond the kind of uh, labeling of Tea Party activists uh, are the ones that have gone out and talked to people and found that I think it's, you know, as a movement or a political current, it's a, you know, a very mixed bag. I mean, there's elements of the Tea Party movement clearly getting a lot of financing for very wealthy, conservative, uh, Republican uh, financial backers. And there's other people who, you know, are quite legitimately upset about the lack of progress on creating jobs and affordable health care and a lot of other things that are, you know, President of uh, Hope and Change uh, you know, said he was going to do for us, and the Democrats uh, with him. So I'm not, uh, you know, somebody that uh, slaps a single label on something as diverse as uh, a movement, which you know clearly is, you know, right-wing populist, but includes a lot of people, who are union members, former union members, uh, among the 15 million unemployed. Um, you know, I think people are lashing out at some of the wrong targets. But maybe that's a failure of people on the other side of the political spectrum to give them, um, uh, you know, a better uh, protest movement vehicle to be part of, including you know the labor movement. I mean, the unions and their allies uh, a month or so ago had a big One Nation rally. I don't know if people from here went down in Washington. It was a big uh, union, immigrant rights organization, civil rights organization, women's organization rally. They had a couple hundred thousand people, very diverse speakers. I mean, that was one attempt to, um, you know, show that uh, there, there is an, uh, an alternative to Tea Party politics, but ideally uh, you would want to have more of the social base of the Tea Party at that kind of rally as opposed to gravitating towards uh, some of the politics and political figures that seem to be capitalizing on on that movement. I got a question. Yeah. I get a sense in the trenches, Karen, maybe you see it too, maybe you all see it, that the students these days, they really are concerned with social justice. We've heard some stuff today. And outside of, let's say, writing, what are some avenues that young people can pursue to do social justice work? And, and maybe not even, even within, even within unions, maybe yeah. not traditional organizing, but other yeah. things within the labor movement that might be an outlet for people's concern with the, with the less fortunate. I think it's, well, it's a current that's running thick among young people these days. Yeah. Well, uh, for people who um, have the language skills, we uh, some facility in Spanish, there's a network of about 150 what are called worker centers around the country. Some of them are uh, survive on foundation grants, some get union money. And they're set up uh, primarily to serve a uh, population of workers who are not in unions, um, but have job problems related to uh, they're not getting paid or they're being mistreated by their employer. The Workers' Center um, 
movement is something you should definitely check out. There's a terrific book about it written uh, by a woman named Janice Fine, a labor studies professor at, at Rutgers. Um, and there are unions, mainly the service employees, the hotel workers, a couple of others that are very interested in hiring former student activists, people who have been involved in social justice work on campus uh, as organizers, as researchers, uh, out in the field, in their headquarters, uh, doing PR work. And um, you know, one of the ways they've tried to revitalize themselves, you know, there is a downside to it, but uh, is by bringing in new blood from the outside people from the United Students Against Sweatshops and other campus-based social justice and community organizations. Um, and uh, a lot of people, uh, the unions pay better than the worker centers. The worker centers tend to be kind of precariously financed. But starting, my daughter ended up uh, working as a nursing home uh, representative for an SEIU local in California. Her starting pay was about 35000 a year. Very good benefits. She had a staff union. It was a union within the union to represent the employees. She became a steward in the staff union. So the conditions of employment in some unions is, are actually pretty good. Uh, others work you pretty hard and have a kind of management by churn model that <laughs> you might want to be wary of. But for people who want to have that kind of experience, um, uh, I think it's unionjobs.com. There's actually an on line site where unions advertise these kind of entry level positions and a lot of people found that were quite student exciting labor. and student labor. What's that? Student labor flat. Yeah? Yep. I don't know if they know. Um, is that another site where they list No, you know, Slap has a chapter at Temple. Oh, okay. Um, usually the, the, the student labor solidarity groups, um, whether they are a SLAP or a SLAC or a USAS chapter, have some kind of union ties. Um, and would have information about summer internships. Sometimes they're actually paid. Um, there's an AFL-CIO program that still operates called Union Summer, um, where people apply and then are placed working as interns with different unions. And definitely these are job opportunities that you might want to check out while in school or, or afterwards. Okay, well, unless there's more questions, thank you very much for coming. Yeah, I want to thank you all. Thank you. 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 Thank you.